All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you again for joining us um, for the Connected Communities webinar um, this morning. Uh, my name, again, for those of you who have recently joined, is Daniel K. Hertz. I'm Director of Policy for the Chicago Department of Housing. Um, I will be joined later in the presentation by Juan Sebastian Arias and Tony Coyejo from the Mayor's Office, um, who are going to help with uh, Q&A at the end. Um, I, uh, as you uh, should have just been uh, alerted, this webinar is being recorded. Um, so if you have to miss anything, um, not to worry, there will be a link and a video posted online um, later, uh, later in the week. Okay, so we can dive right in um, and share um, the agenda of what we're going over today in the webinar. Um, Want to start with why are we here? Um, what are the goals of this webinar? What are we hoping that you get out of this? Um, then uh, what is the Connected Communities Ordinance? Just a little bit of background of um, what this ordinance is that was passed in uh, the summer of last year um, and where it came from. And then the bulk of our time is gonna be in that third spot. What does the Connected Communities Ordinance mean for you and your neighborhood and your work? Um, we're gonna go through four different scenarios, um, uh, four different development scenarios where the Connected Communities Ordinance is gonna have um, potentially a major effect on how development works uh, in the city. And then finally, we'll have, uh, should have plenty of time for Q&A um, as, uh, as we wrap up. I wanna note that um, I'm, I'm sure that questions will pop up as we are going through the presentation. Um, there is a Q&A uh, function uh, that you'll see in your uh, sort of Zoom control panel. So please, um, if you want to submit a written question so that you don't forget it before the Q&A uh, section of the agenda, um, please submit that question through the Q&A function. Um, and that way it'll be in, uh, in line uh, for uh, us to answer um, when we get to that portion of the presentation. So moving uh, right along, I wanna talk about why are we here? Um, and really simply the goal is to help break down this new ordinance that's still just about six months old um, to help um, all of you um, and Chicagoans in general understand what this ordinance means for your community, um, where you live um, and for your work if you are in um, the development space in one way or another. Um, and again, just to, to repeat, uh, the slides and the video recording of this uh, session will be posted after the webinar. Um, in addition, we will be sharing to those who have registered um, a series of one-pagers breaking down specific provisions of the ordinance in slightly more detail um, than we may be talking about uh, on this webinar. Um, so look for that as well. Okay, so what is the Connected Communities Ordinance? Um, as I said, it was passed in last summer in July of 2022, and the ordinance really built on the Equitable Transit Oriented Development Policy Plan, um, which was developed by uh, more than 80 stakeholders across community organizations, advocacy and industry, um, and published the prior year, and really laid out a vision of um, changes to development policy, zoning policy, especially um, to try to reshape uh, the city's development around transit uh, and, uh, and, and sustainable transportation in a more equitable way. It is a really broad ordinance. If you have tried to uh, read it or you, you've read it, you know this. Um, it has many, many different provisions. Uh, tackling many different aspects of development, many different sorts of scenarios, um, but it's held together by a vision of development in the city that really tries to accomplish three things. Um, the first is bringing more homes and more jobs near transit. The second is making streets safer by reducing crashes um, and traffic violence. And the final one is creating diverse and affordable and accessible housing in every neighborhood of the city, especially near transit. 
Um, and so all of the provisions in the ordinance um, are falling under one or more of these three high level goals. So with that very brief background, um, we really wanna dive into in the most concrete way we can, what does connected communities um, mean for um, the city, for you, for your neighborhood, for your work? We're gonna do this um, rather than by uh, going through the different provisions of the ordinance, we wanna sort of flip that around and say, if you're in a particular um, scenario, there's a particular type of building or development site in your neighborhood or that you're, um, you're working on, um, how, does, how do the different provisions of connected communities apply to that scenario or to that development site? So we're going to go through four um, sort of stylized scenarios, um, rehabbing uh, an older existing building to add more housing to it, um, building a new multifamily housing, building a new three flat type development, um, and then renovating an existing uh, three flat type development. So to kick us off, we're gonna think about um, an existing older building, uh, residential building on a residential street. Um, we're talking here about buildings that are already zoned fairly high density, uh, meaning RM, for those of you familiar with the zoning code, the, the higher levels of residential uh, density zoning. Um, you're often gonna find these along the North and South Lakefront neighborhoods. Um, as well as parts of the west side. And we're thinking here about a rehab type development rather than uh, tear down and new construction. Importantly, the Connected Communities Ordinance does not change uh, the underlying zoning or density allowed in these types of situations, right? So, um, you know, we're imagining here a situation with a standard city size lot. Um, and a, a zoning designation that allows for eight units um, before the Connected Communities Ordinance. And with the Connected Communities Ordinance, still there are eight units that would be allowed on this parcel. What is different is that we know that in many situations, what is restricting um, property owners from adding units to these buildings um, is not necessarily the allowed density, it's the required parking. Up through um, July of last year, um, one for one parking would have been required in this sort of situation. So if you wanted to get up to eight units, you would need eight parking spaces off, off, off street parking spaces. And um, frequently the, simply the geometry, the physical space of the lot would not allow that much parking to be um, provided. Uh, and so functionally, uh, it was not possible to uh, include the number of units that were actually um, technically allowed by the zoning designation. Connected communities, however, for the first time, expend, extends um, transit-oriented development uh, parking flexibilities to RM uh, residential zoning, meaning that now with the Connected Communities Ordinance, the same parcel uh, requires uh, only four parking spaces or one for every two units. And through an administrative adjustment, you can actually, the property owner can actually apply for as little as um, zero uh, off street parking. Again, that would have to be approved um, by the planning department through an administrative adjustment. But um, what this means is, and we have seen um, a handful of these types of developments in the months since Connected Communities was passed. Uh, what this means is that in more circumstances, it will be possible to actually provide the number of units that are allowed by zoning um, because there is no longer a one-for-one -one parking requirement um, in these situations. Um, so this is one, uh, one scenario um, with an older building, uh, older residential building, again, in RM type zoning, um, where we've already seen some, um, some take up, some use of uh, connected communities provisions 
um, extending these parking flexibilities to high density residential zones. So that was a relatively quick one. Um, we're now going to dive into um, a more multifaceted one, which is new multifamily construction. So here we're talking um, probably about a commercial street, an arterial street, talking about zoning that is uh, a B, C, or D designation. Um, and again, we're talking now about new construction um, rather than uh, rehab. Um, a major thing to know about the way that the connected communities affects these type of parcels before we dive into um, you know, what it looks like in a particular building is that while the previous TOD policy applied parking flexibilities and some bonuses to these zoning designations, Connected communities substantially expands um, the geographic area where those flexibilities and bonuses are available. So there's a little chart there in the bottom left corner. Um, you can see before connected communities ordinance, um, the, these uh, uh, provisions were triggered by CTA and Metro rail stations. Um, but only for a quarter mile radius around those stations with a, with a, with a small number of exceptions. Um, similarly, uh, the bus, uh, bus, only 12 bus routes um, triggered these provisions across the city, um, similarly with a one quarter mile radius from those 12 bus routes. Now under connected communities, those have been substantially changed and expanded. So CTA and Metro stations still trigger uh, these opportunities, but now it's a standard half mile radius from all CTA and Metro rail lines. So essentially a doubling of the radius where these provisions apply. Um, and in, in addition, um, the bus routes have been expanded from those initial 12 to all high frequency bus routes in the city of Chicago. So what does that mean? It means a bus that comes at least every 15 minutes um, during midday, which is you know one or scheduled to come every 15 minutes during midday. Um, and obviously more frequently during rush hour. So quarter mile radius within uh, all of those high frequency bus routes also now trigger these um, provisions in the zoning code. Um, I know the map on the right is, um, you're not going to be able to read particular streets on that, but I wanted to include that as a snapshot of the city to give a sense of how broad this is. Um, the purple highlighted areas are um, parcels that were eligible for TOD um, provisions under the old zoning code. And the orange areas are ones that are newly eligible under connected communities. Um, and you'll see, I think, sort of two big um, areas of expansion. Um, one, again, are those uh, RM zones predominantly on the North Lakefront, South Lakefront through Bronzeville and Washington Park and um, parts of the West Side um, through uh, Garfield Park and Austin. Um, but then also you can see um, uh, sort of a network of arterials uh, designated in orange um, all throughout the city, um, including on the northwest and southwest sides. And those really represent the new bus lines that are newly, um, newly eligible for TOD provisions. So with that in mind of how many new, um, new parcels, new uh, neighborhoods are, are eligible for the provisions, these bonuses and flexibilities, um, let's talk about what this might mean for a particular project. So again, we're thinking about a commercial street. Um, on this, in this scenario, um, we're thinking specifically of um, a B or C zone with a dash three density uh, bonus, or excuse me, density designation. Um, and again, thinking of new construction. Um, and here we're gonna talk about um, changes to the existing um, TOD bonuses under connected communities that are related to affordability. So before connected communities, um, there were both uh, bonuses to the number of units you could build in a B or C-3 near transit, 
as well as FAR bonuses, meaning um, increases to the square footage of the building. Um, those went up to uh, the unit bonus uh, went as high as 33%, um, but required um, between 50 and 100% of the required affordable units that are triggered by a zoning change to be placed on site in order to unlock those unit bonuses. Um, conversely, the FAR bonus, the square footage bonus, um, did not require any uh, on-site uh, affordable units um, beyond what the ARO, uh, the Affordable Requirements Ordinance, um, would otherwise uh, designate. Under the Connected Communities Ordinance, the unit bonus um, or minimum lot area bonus, if you're um, using uh, zoning terminology, um, has stayed the same, um, both in terms of the size and in terms of the required um, on-site uh, affordability. What has changed is the requirement to unlock the FAR or square footage bonus. So now, um, as with the unit bonus, you also need to provide more on-site units um, than you would otherwise have to provide more on-site affordable units in order to unlock um, that's that FAR bonus. Um, this is not increasing, to be clear, not increasing the total set aside of affordability that the ARO requires, but it is saying that units that you might otherwise, or that the developer might otherwise have been able to pay for with an in lieu fee or through off-site construction, now have to be on-site um, in order to unlock these bonuses. And again, that's sort of part of the thrust of the ordinance to try to create more affordability in these projects near transit. So that's uh, a change to an existing density bonus uh, in the TOD law in Chicago. But the Connected Communities Ordinance also creates a new type of density bonus um, that's actually available in any B, C, or D district, whether it's a dash three, or some other designation. Um, and we refer to this as the parking swap bonus because the idea is basically that um, a development can take square footage space in the building um, that would have been used for structured parking and instead replace it with, um, with units, including affordable units. Um, I want to say before I start sort of explaining the numbers here, this one is a little bit complex and it has some additional, um, some additional sort of technical requirements in terms of, um, uh, in terms of other sort of uh, designations like a, a plan development designation that have to be reached in order to um, make this bonus possible. Um, more detail, if you're sort of looking for that level of detail, um, there'll be more details in the, um, one pager series that we share um, after this webinar um, and also happy to talk more about it in the Q&A. Um, but I'll go over the basics of how this will work um, uh, on this slide. So I wanna imagine a building um, before it has tried to use this bonus that has a hundred units. It offers 50 parking spaces. So one for every two units. Um, no additional square feet or additional units because it hasn't used this bonus yet. Um, and it's triggered the ARO, which means that it has a set aside of 20%, um, of which five have to be on site and 15 can be some combination of uh, off site or paid for with an in lieu payment. Now, if we imagine um, that they want to remove more parking and use that space um, to add more units under this new bonus. If they reduce parking um, by uh, another 10, that means that they're now at less than one parking space for every two units, which is one of the requirements for unlocking this bonus. Once they've done that, um, for every parking space that they are not providing, there is a 350 square foot um, bonus of, uh, of, of 
floor space that can be used for housing um, over and above the FAR um, otherwise allowed by the zoning designation. Why 350 square feet? That is the amount of uh, space that is allowed to be added for structured parking uh, currently that doesn't count against FAR. So essentially you're taking that 350 square feet for a parking space and converting it to 350 square feet that can be used for additional housing. Um, and in this case, you take 60 parking spaces below 100 um, that are not being built, multiply by 350, um, and you get up to 21,000 new square feet that can be added to this building um, for housing. In addition, you, the units that you add in that additional square feet can be added over and above the maximum number of units that would otherwise be allowed in this building. So take, for example, let's suppose that in this scenario, they take those 21,000 up to 21,000 square feet and add 19 units. Um, this is now a 119 unit building. Um, and two things happen um, in addition to um, the space being switched from parking space to residential space. Um, number one, the ARO requirement, the affordability requirement is still 20%. So we're doing 20% of 119, which is 24. Um, but in addition, the number of required on-site units increases by one for each additional unit that is added through this bonus. So you can see here, um, rather than doing five affordable units on site and 15 that could be off site or in lieu, um, this project would now have to do 24 units. So still 20% of the total building. Um, but now those units need to be on site rather than being uh, off site or in lieu. Um, and so you have a, a, overall a building that's gone from 100 units to 119 units. Um, with still a 20% set aside uh, of affordability that's now on site. So that is, um, again, probably one of the more complex scenarios with multiple um, provisions that apply to it. Um, gone through two of the bigger ones. Um, now I wanna move on to the third scenario, which is a new three plot. Um, different type of building, different type of environment. Here we're talking about a residential street um, zoning is a low to moderate density of RS or RT. Um, obviously, for those of you who know the zoning code, if it's a three flat, we're probably talking RT. Um, and again, we're talking about a new construction building. Um, so before connected communities ordinance, if we're talking about um, say an RT4 zone on a standard lot, um, that would allow for three units, um, none of which would likely be accessible um, for up to a height of 38 feet and one-to-one -one parking. So three parking spaces would be required. And often it'll look something like this picture on the right-hand side of the screen, um, where there is a raised um, first floor with a half basement underneath. Um, often these are structured as a you know, duplex down in the first floor and, and half basement and then two simplex units on the second and third floors. What does connected communities ordinance, how does the connected communities ordinance change this scenario? The connected communities ordinance creates a new incentive for these type of buildings um, related to accessible units, meaning um, units that are uh, able to be uh, used um, without any barriers by people with mobility impairments, you know, wheelchair or other sort of situation. <clears throat> and essentially what it says is that if you add an accessible unit to this type of building, that will not count against your um, FAR, against your square footage, or against your maximum number of units. Meaning if you add an accessible unit, you can now build four units on this property instead of three. How do you do that? <clears throat> you do that by lifting the half basement up to be flush with the ground. In order to do that, um, this provision also increases the allowed height by four feet 
from 38 feet to 42. <coughs> Excuse me. And the other thing that it does is <clears throat> it recognizes that if one for one parking is required, it's often really difficult to fit four parking spaces on a standard city lot uh, that's you know 25 or 28 feet wide. And so what it says is that if you use this bonus, if you add a unit to the building by adding an accessible unit, um, your parking requirement essentially is only one space for every eight feet of frontage uh, on the lot, meaning you don't have to try to squeeze in more parking off the alley than there is physically room for. Um, it also says that if you provide a um, physically handicap accessible spot, that that counts for two spots. So you can imagine a situation here where um, <clears throat> the developer provides one um, larger uh, handicap accessible spot off the alley and one non-accessible spot. Um, and so they provide two parking spaces off the alley for a four unit building. We have a, a very crude um, diagram here to sort of indicate what this might look like. Um, on the left side is sort of the existing condition of, of what this building looks like, <clears throat> where you have unit number one split between an elevated first floor and a half basement, and then units two and three stacked above. On the right-hand side, you have the sort of configuration um, using this provision of connected communities. <clears throat> You've lifted that, that half basement up to be flush with the, the ground, um, made the building slightly taller just by a couple feet, um, and now you have one unit, the, an accessible unit on the ground floor, and units two through four stacked above it. Um, and finally, um, rounding us out in scenario four, um, talk about what it might look like to renovate an existing two flat and how this is different under um, <clears throat> connected communities versus the prior zoning law. Um, again, here we're talking about a residential side street, most likely, um, talking about an RT type zoning designation, um, and talking about a rehab now um, rather than a um, new construction. So, really talking about two main variables here, two main options <clears throat> that somebody might be looking at when they're looking at rehabbing an older two flat. Um, one is deconverting it, doing a gut rehab, um, and converting it into a single family home. It's obviously a common development practice in parts of the city. Um, before the connected communities ordinance, um, you could do that as of right, no matter what the residential designation was, um, low, med medium, or, or high density, um, you could build a single family home in a residential zone without any additional zoning permission. The other thing that you might want to do, that people do sometimes want to do, is you might say, okay, legally, there are two units in this building, but people have been living in the basement, <clears throat> have been treating that as a unit for years and years and years. And um, is there a way to bring that you know, existing informal unit into compliance? Um, previously, <clears throat> that was allowed if you could show the the unit had been used as a residential unit um, for 50 years, then it could be brought essentially um, into legal compliance and, and the building could be considered a three unit building rather than a two unit building. Connected communities um, adjusts both of these options. <clears throat> so, in terms of the deconversion option to a single family home, it adds some restrictions to this um, <clears throat> in certain parts of the city. So in what are called um, community preservation areas, which are parts of the city where <clears throat> um, there is a substantial risk for currently existing displacement of low and moderate income people um, as determined by um, Department of Housing analysis of um, uh, of, of housing and demographic data, um, you can no longer build a or, or create a new single family home as of right 
in an RT or RM district. So in a moderate or high density residential district, you can no longer build or create a, through deconversion, a single family home as of right. Um, at now it will require a zoning change to a single family designation. So to an RS zone. Um, so, and, and I think the way to think of this is the same way that you would need a um, zoning change to increase the density, most likely, of the property. Um, you also need a, a, a zoning change to decrease the density of the property. And, you know, again, this is driving at the goal of having um, affordable and accessible housing for um, everyone in um, all neighborhoods near transit. Um, because we know that the naturally occurring affordable housing that um, often exists in these types of buildings is a really important source um, of, of, of moderate priced housing for many Chicagoans <clears throat> that is, <clears throat> excuse me, that is removed when um, these buildings are deconverted um, into single family homes often. Conversely, <clears throat> um, if you want to legalize a non-conforming um, that's already in existence, that has become easier. So rather than requiring evidence that a, uh, you know, the basement unit there has been occupied for 50 years in order to legalize it, connected communities shortened that to 20 years. Um, so only evidence um, that it's been in use for 20 years is now required to legalize um, that, that additional unit um, that is, you know, currently occupied, but is not technically um, a legal unit in the property. A few other things to note. So that takes us through the four uh, scenarios that we wanted to talk about. Um, uh, I'm gonna note a few other provisions that I didn't get into in one of these scenarios, but I want to make you aware of and happy to answer questions about these. Um, and then uh, once I've gone through this, I will pass it over to my colleague, uh, Juan Sebastian Arias in the mayor's office um, to um, lead us through the question and answer portion. Um, but so a few, a few things to know. Um, number one is that parking reductions um, that were already allowed under the previous ordinance um, have now been made easier because they are now an administrative adjustment rather than a special use permit. Um, so wherever those parking reductions beyond 50%, um, so less than one space per two units, <clears throat> wherever those are available, um, you can now do that through an administrative adjustment rather than a special use permit. Um, in addition, there are new rules that, that apply to developments that are at least 20% affordable, whether they're subsidized or whether um, they're simply placing all 20% of their ARO units on site <clears throat> um, that are in high cost neighborhoods um, to require a vote in zoning committee. So essentially, if a zoning application for this type of building has been filed and the zoning committee doesn't act um, within 300 days, the um, applicant, the developer, can essentially request a vote to take place within 60 days. Um, and zoning committee must vote on it within that period, or if they don't, um, it will automatically be reported out to full council with a due pass recommendation. Um, there are also some other <clears throat> provisions around this, including a requirement that there be a public meeting um, uh, that's well noticed, um, but that is a major change to zoning process for um, buildings that meet those qualifications. Um, in addition, uh, the allowance for um, roof features um, um, like elevator penthouses or um, you know, uh, other sort of <clears throat> light structures on the roof has been expanded from our districts to also cover B and C districts, um, which uh, is another um, way that, that essentially um, allows uh, developments to actually make use of the full development rights that they already have. Um, without sort of being artificially um, constrained by that, um, by that roof feature provision. Um, and then finally, CDOT <clears throat> is also um, developing uh, transportation demand management planning rules. Um, they've been directed, the ordinance directs them to, to develop those. 
um, uh, that will apply to certain um, new developments um, under connected communities. And so there will be a public comment around that. And so I definitely encourage everyone on this call to look out for that and, um, and provide input on those uh, rules when they are published uh, later this year. Um, and then finally, I, I already shared this, but we do, we have put together a new one pager series um, uh, featuring different um, provisions of the Connected Communities Ordinance, describing them um, sometimes in a little bit more detail than I've gone into uh, today. Um, so we will send that to all, to everyone who has registered for this webinar uh, later today. With that, I will stop talking and I'll invite my colleague from the mayor's office, Juan Sebastian Arias um, and Tommy Criejo to um, come and lead us through questions and answers. And thank you all so much for your attention for this morning. Thank you, Daniel. Good morning, everybody. Um, and actually, Daniel, I don't know if you can control this, but I can turn my video on, um, which is not the biggest deal, but, um, but yeah, if you, if, if, you do, if, you, if you are able to influence that, I'll, I'll turn it on. Um, all right, so again, good morning, everybody. Um, as Daniel mentioned, um, my name is Juan Sebastian Arias, first deputy of policy in the mayor's office. Um, and I'm also joined by my colleague, Timmy um, Koyeju. Um, oh, and there goes my video. Okay, so good to, um, thanks all for joining us. I see there's a number of questions already coming in through the chat, which we'll start going through. Um, and I welcome uh, others of uh, anyone who hasn't submitted a question yet to just um, continue to do so, but we'll just start um, powering uh, through these. So um, Heather, I'll start with yours or I'll go in the order that I believe I saw them here. Um, I believe um, Daniel actually spoke to this a bit with uh, one of the scenarios, but you asked, does the ordinance have minimum density requirements? Um, and you have an example of in your neighborhood of five single family homes that were torn down to build uh, one giant one. Um, so. Uh, within the ordinance, um, I think it was in the sin third scenario, I want to say that Daniel presented where uh, he talked about uh, this one provision um, that protects against um, deconversions in areas or, or on uh, zoning districts that are zoned for higher density residential, um, that they would um, have that a single family home would not be um, possible to build anymore unless uh, without a zoning change. Um, so there is um, a provision that gets to this. Again, that only apply, or that, that specific provision applies to the community preservation areas as designated under the affordable requirements ordinance. And those are essentially um, parts of the city that are facing um, displace, displacement pressures or rising um, housing costs. So um, if I, hopefully that, that responds, and actually, you know, Daniel, Timmy, feel free to chime in at any point as well. Um, but Heather, hopefully that responds to your question. Um, feel free to drop something else into the into the Q and A if it does not. Um, all right. So next question I see comes from Jim Wheaton. If the developer receives the advantages of adding an accessible unit, is there also a requirement that the accessible unit be rented to a disabled resident? Uh, and if so, how will the city monitor this? Currently, there there is no requirement that it be rented to a disabled resident. Um, the, the intent behind that, um, that new accessibility option or incentive was really to increase the supply of accessible units, ground level accessible units in the city. And uh, we do not have, there is no requirement right now that they be rented exclusively to disabled residents. And so that is not something that we will, um, that the city will be monitoring. The next question I see um, from Craig Yarbrough. Um, and so this is, I think, a broad question, but what is the smallest building type that can utilize these new rules? Uh, and Timmy, Daniel, feel free to uh, help me respond to this one. I think the my short start of an answer is that it depends on which rule exactly. Um, as uh, you probably noted, there are uh, different 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 rules within this within the new ordinance apply to different zoning districts. Um, largely that includes B, C, or D. Um, and in some cases, the higher density residential R and five and above. Um, so depending on what is the smallest building that could be built on one of those, in one of those zoning districts and for which uh, incentive or which new rule um, would help. Um, that's where, uh, depending on all those factors is how small a building could be that could utilize. 
Yeah, the only thing, this is Daniel again, the only thing I would I would add, I, you know, I think the, the provision that applies to the lowest density is probably the accessibility bonus, <clears throat> which technically does go, applies all the way down to um, RS, so single family zones. Um, so I think theoretically the smallest building that you could see that applying to is a two flat. Um, the other ones, as, as Juan Sebastian was saying, um, may apply only to B and C um, and D or RM, so high density and mixed use developments where you're probably going to see, you know, multifamily, um, larger multifamily buildings that, that can take advantage of those. Thank you, Daniel. Um, all right, so Craig, hopefully that, that gives you a sense. And if you have a more specific version of that question, feel free to, um, to drop it into the, or if there's a specific rule that you were thinking about, um, feel free to ask a follow-up too. Um, all right, next from Butler uh, Adams. Um, and I appreciate some of the intent behind this question. Uh, why are these menial changes being made without looking at the bigger picture? Chicago is underzoned. Why aren't all sizable vacant lots near transit, including Metro Electric, uh, being rezoned B3 5 uh, or B3 uh, through um, 5? Um, so, uh, again, I appreciate the, the, the intent or like the, the spirit of, of what you're asking, Butler. Uh, I would argue that there are more than uh, that these changes, and, and you know, Daniel only talked through a few of them. Um, I would argue that they're not menial, but to respond to what your to your actual question here, um, um, the ordinance itself, as we've noted earlier, does not change the underlying zoning districts or the zoning map. Um, I think this is uh, there is a big opportunity to focus on the you know the questions you're asking about what is actually what zoning districts are near um, near transit. And how to encourage more, um, uh, uh, you know, higher density uses. Um, as you can probably imagine, or as I think you know, the legislative process is is one uh, is both an art is, is a mix of art and science. And so um, we felt we feel strongly, and I am personally very proud of what we were able to accomplish through this ordinance, and look forward to um, further reforms um, to keep exploring to advance our ETOD goals. Yeah, um, I think that's a really good summary. And uh, I would also point folks to the E2OD policy plan, which this Connected Communities Ordinance was able to implement a good number of aspects. There's still definitely more that is envisioned in that broader policy vision and agenda, which was created with um, many other uh, civic, nonprofit, and governmental partners in the city. So uh, I would certainly direct folks to that E2D policy plan um, that the city released in 2021 to, to get a better sense of some of the other areas that we see as um, co-committant with, with some of these zoning changes, as well as um, where we hope we can continue to go as a city in the years to come. Thank you, Timmy. Um, and maybe one last uh, note, Butler, is that, is that uh, you know, I appreciate you raising this. I think um, raising this with council, with your alderman, with continuing to raise it with us is, is all going to be needed um, to get uh, to get um, um, to move in the direction of what you're what you're asking. All right, we have a, a question from an anonymous attendee. How do owners demonstrate a basement unit has been used as resident as a residential unit for 20 years? I actually don't um, uh, don't know the answer to this myself, Daniel. I'm not sure if if you do. Yeah, I you know that's one where I unfortunately we don't have um, yeah. uh, the um, zoning staff with us today, um, but that's something that we can definitely include in some follow up uh, answers. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the best way to do that because I don't want to speculate beyond my area of expertise. Yeah, sounds good. Right, so we will um, we will follow up with some responses to anything that we cannot um, that we're not able to respond live. We will include as a follow up too. Um, all right, Carla uh, August, uh, Augustinelli from West Central Association. Thank you for the presentation. Will this be available to download after the meeting? Uh, yes, we will be putting up the recording, and I believe we can put we will um, put up the slides as well and share that as part of the follow up. All right, Paul um, 
question, uh, did the accessibility requirements for the on-site affordable units remain the same with the scenarios where they can increase unit counts? So I can, I can take that. I think this is a question around uh, buildings that trigger the affordable requirements ordinance. So I think the short answer is um, yes, uh, nothing in connected communities is going to reduce any of the requirements um, that come with the ARO, which the new, the 2021 ARO requires that all on-site affordable units um, be accessible. Um, in the instance of the accessibility incentive that we talked about um, with the three flat type developments, I think those are likely to be used in, in smaller buildings that don't trigger the ARO. So ARO only triggers at, at buildings that are 10 units or more. Um, and so likely those are not gonna be sort of overlapping um, situations. But in any case, no matter, no matter what the situation is, there's no instance in which connected communities is going to reduce the requirements for accessibility that exist in other laws. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, another question, um, actually this, I see a question about a grant uh, opportunity, which maybe we'll circle back to, because I did, I did want to make sure that we um, plug that when we're closing out. Um, but to stay specific on the Connected Communities Ordinance, um, I see another question from Roberto Requejo. Can you talk more about how the ordinance makes uh, streets safer for pedestrians, bikers, people in wheelchairs, et cetera? And yeah, Roberto, thank you for the question. This is um, one of those provisions that we did not um, uh, spend a lot of time or focused on right now. So um, uh, under the Connected Communities Ordinance, um, new uh, developments uh, that are within a uh, half mile of rail stations and that are on um, business, commercial, um, or downtown uh, districts, and actually maybe a couple more too. Um, we um, now the ordinance extends the same people-friendly design guidelines that are already included in the uh, pedestrian street designation um, to uh, to those new developments. Um, so that's one of the biggest ways in which this ordinance um, uh, uh, seeks to. Um, uh, encourage and require, honestly, uh, more pedestrian friendly or people friendly um, standards for new development. And that includes um, some um, limitations on uh, things like new uh, driveways or drive throughs. Um, there is an option to go, um, uh, there is the administrative adjustment option as well um, to, 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 to seek approval for a development that does not meet all of those pedestrian street requirements. Um, but that is one, that is another piece, thank you, Roberto, that we did not um, talk about much in this presentation so far. Okay, um, uh, another, uh, another comment follow up from, from Butler, thank you of noting the courtyards uh, that the 19, the uh, much, I think, beloved 1920s courtyard buildings um, would not be able to be built today because they're considered nonconforming. I think this is just a comment, but um, uh, but uh, I hear that and I do agree, um, do agree. And I'm scanning for other questions. I see another one just came through from Michael. The ordinance says that maximum accessory parking counts near transit is 50% of unit count, which is okay for apartments, but doesn't make sense for condominiums. Is there thought on clarifying that or is administrative adjustment the only way to obtain relief for that issue? Uh, yes, the administrative adjustment is the only way to obtain relief um, in that in that situation or in, or in any um, in any situation um, seeking to add more than the 50% um, default right now. Another question coming in. Thanks for you know keeping these coming in. Uh, do gut renovations of an older 10 plus unit building within a half mile radius of CTA trigger ARO. Uh, Daniel, I might pass it to you. Yeah, so if, um, if it is simply a renovation of uh, a no change to the number of units, then I believe the answer is no. Um, so and I think that's what you're asking. Um, so if you're simply renovating you know, a 12 unit building, um, 
keeping the same number of units, then no, that should not trigger the ARO. All right, another question. Has the Department of Housing and Transportation Planning ever gotten together with a CTA Metro map of Chicago to make a plan along the lengths of those lines and the vacant lots uh, along them? Um, we have street quarter plans being made, but not transit quarter plans. I think there's, yeah, I think you're, you're right in that there's um, um, a lot of, that there are more um, corridor level plans versus, um, um, I think what you're, then I think what you're suggesting. There is one example right now, and this is, this is uh, maybe more in the street corridor area, but there is an ETOD, uh, directly ETOD um, oriented planning effort along 95th Street, um, but connecting, um, looking at the stretch of, I forget exactly what, but connecting the uh, 95th Street Red Line Station and some and the nearby, um, uh, other nearby transportation assets. Oh, great. Um, okay, so any other last questions about the connected communities ordinance? If not, we can give a quick, um, we can speak a little bit to the uh, current grant opportunities that, uh, that are open that GPD is offering that we're very excited about. Um, all right, I'm not seeing any other questions come in, so we'll just pivot to that. Uh, so um, I'm not sure how familiar everyone might be with this, but there are, um, as part of the city's Chicago recovery plan, um, uh, the uh, DPD, Department of Planning and Development, has $10 million um, as a part of a larger uh, ETOD initiative. And that includes um, both uh, development and pre-development grant opportunities. Um, the difference, I believe the original question here is what's the differences between the development grant and the pre-development grant? So the main difference is in the amount and the stage of projects that are, um, that are ideal candidates for each grant opportunity. Uh, the ETOD development grants um, currently are up to $250,000 uh, grants. Um, and those are for ideally for um, projects that are later in the stage, more shovel ready, um, and that meet um, other criteria around being both equitable and transit oriented. Uh, the pre-development grants um, are um, for earlier stage projects seeking to refine their scope, um, um, uh, or you know, just in that earlier uh, pre-development phase, those that opportunity is up to those grants are up to one hundred and fifty thousand, and they of uh, again, of course, would have the similar criteria, the same criteria around equitable um, about an equitable development and transit-oriented development as well. And we have more specifics about uh, what what we mean by by those criteria. Um, you can find more information up online at shy.gov/etod. We actually have resources there about the Connected Communities Ordinance as well, and you can find uh, more information about um, the various, um, uh, uh, all the various initiatives related to the larger ETOD work at the city. Um, I wanna double check the, I do wanna share the dates for the, the grant deadlines. So just let me quickly double check those, but we will also make sure to um, send out information about the grant opportunities um, as well. And I see a follow-up question. Uh, you, uh, a pro one project cannot receive both a pre-development grant and a development grant. Um, so uh, I would recommend um, being thoughtful about where in the, um, uh, about which, uh, in what stage of development your project, uh, a, a given project is and what would be a better fit. Oh, and the last thing I did want to actually make sure the big thing that I want to make sure to emphasize also is that as a part of that grant program, all grantees will uh, will receive or have and have access to a technical assistance, um, a two technical assistance. Um, so a, a $1 million out of that $10 million larger budget um, is funding um, targeted assistance ranging from depending on what the needs are of grantees. Um, but to um, support the, the actual, you know, to, to, to support the, the further development and to help make sure that um, all the, the community visions that come through the, those grant opportunities um, are more able to get to fruition. And I see a last question here. Can one developer receive grants for multiple projects? I'm going to hold, uh, that might, we might have to follow up with that unless Timmy, you might recall the response. 
Um, I I think I'll hold on that. I have a eighty percent confident answer, but don't want to spread any uh, anything that's wrong. So we can get back to you on that one. Okay, well, um, I am not seeing any other questions about the ordinance coming through um, or about the current grant opportunity. Um, uh, so we will follow up with some of the information that we could not, or some of the questions or responses that we could not answer live. Um, and I think otherwise, Daniel, I'll, I'll pass it to you to, to close us out. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Mount Sebastian and Timmy. Thank you, all of you who uh, attended the webinar. Um, as we said, the video will be posted um, online. Um, Timmy shared in the chat box uh, a great website to go for references for the information about the policy plan and um, grantsshy.gov slash EPOD. Um, so look for more information there. You can also expect to receive in your inboxes um, a uh, attachment of the one pager series that we mentioned earlier, um, as well as some follow ups on some of those questions um, that we needed to get back on. Um, so with that, again, thanks so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining us this morning.